Hi everyone. I'm glad you're here tonight. So uh, you appreciate for taking your time to join us for the DES public hearing. Uh, tonight's public hearing is being live streamed and it is being recorded. Any testimony that we hear tonight will go into the into the um, portal record. Um, it will be included in the project supporting money and official documentation. Uh, I'm Nora Madonic from Our Street Communications. I'll be facilitating tonight's hearings and the comments that we're going to receive from folks here and online. Uh, tonight, we're also joined by Robert White for the KORF, who will be providing a um, background on the project after I go over some rules of order. If you need them, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at them, materials related to the DEIS are available online. Uh, if you take a look at BDCA's uh, website at dqca.my.gov, take a look at the resiliency page, the sustainability and resiliency page, and you'll find them there. So just a little bit of background on the project. The Northwest Battery Park City was Resiliency Project is an integrated coastal flood risk management project in Lower Manhattan. BPCA developed the project in response to the devastating impact of Superstorm Sandy in Lower Manhattan and in anticipation of future severe storm activity and sea level rise related to global climate change. As part of the State Environmental Quality Review Act, also known as SEEKER, BPCA has prepared a draft environmental impact statement, also known as a DEIS. It analyzes the potential environmental impacts of the proposed North West Battery Park City project. BPCA has developed this DEIS after considerable um, input and comment during a public scoping process that began in late 2022. So the DEIS covers four significant areas, and you may want to take a look at these when you go pull the documents down if you haven't done so already. One is it provides information about the project, the project's purpose, and the per project's need, in addition to the benefits of the project. Second, it will provide information about the project's potential environmental impacts. Third, you'll find information about the project's plans to mitigate any potential significant adverse environmental impacts that have been identified. And fourth, you'll find information about design alternatives that have been considered for the project. BPCA has made the Northwest Tabry Park City Resiliency Project, DE on the Fs, available for public review and comment. Um, again, it's available on the project website if you've not looked at that yet. So let's take a look at how we're going to comment tonight. And let's go over how we comment and how we participate. I'll do that now, and I'll come back after um, Bob finishes his um, section and does the overview and we'll go over them in detail so everybody has a chance to participate. Mm. So how to comment. Um, the public review and comment period on the DEIS started on August 28, 2024, and it will continue through October 7. So there are several ways to comment. One is by being here tonight. You can make a verbal comment here in this room as well as by our friends online. We have about, I don't know, 30 or 35 people who are online right now, um, and that may increase. Um, each person who is attending and wishes to make a comment will be invited to speak for up to three minutes. Uh, the questions and comments that we receive today will be entered into the final environmental impact statement and addressed there. So it is important to recognize that um, comments and questions that are raised tonight by speakers, this is a night for hearing from the public, um, but comments and questions will not be responded to tonight. Uh, you can also mail or email your, your written comments, and there are two ways. 
One is to the Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project team at 200 Liberty Street, 24th floor, New York 10281, or by email at nwbpcrinfo at bpca.ny.gov. Um, for those of you, and I, and I see many familiar faces here, and I know that there are folks online who have joined uh, in, in many of the public meetings, um, the community meetings, which have been opportunities for engagement, for conversation, for discussion, for debate. Um, tonight's public hearing will not feature a question and answer session. Also, during tonight's hearing, you're going to hear a range of opinions. Um, and I like to suggest to people at each of these hearings that every comment is welcome and every comment is considered equally. Um, would ask you to be polite to your neighbors and, and other community members who you may or may not agree with. Um, every comment is welcome. So let's talk about how to participate. So after uh, we hear from Robert White and his overview of the project, we'll open up for public comment. We'll be doing, we'll be rotating between in-person and online comment. We'll take about five of each and go back and forth. Um, as mentioned previously, there'll be no response if you ask a question, but it will be entered into the record and answered in the FEIS. Um, for anyone who has pre-registered to make a comment, you'll have one opportunity and you will have up to three minutes to speak. Elected officials, if any are here, um, will receive up to five minutes to state their comment or question, recognizing that they are speaking on behalf of a larger set of constituents. Also, the community board and neighborhood organizations will also have the opportunity for one representative to give testimony of up to five minutes to speak on behalf of the organization. So when you come up to speak, when you get to about 30 seconds before the end of your time, uh, one of the facilitators will give you a heads up that it's time to wrap up um, and will appreciate your, your comments and testimony and then move on. So I'll be back after Robert shares his presentation and then we will hear from you. So thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming and taking the time to join us. Uh, I'm Robert or Bob White. I'm with AKRF. Uh, we were the lead uh, preparers assisting the Battery Park City Authority, who was the lead agency in um, the preparation of the environmental impact statement. And we were uh, joined by AECOM and Matrix, who were uh, engineering, who were um, um, important participants in the preparation as well. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a, a background, of four or five slides on the background of the project, what the purpose is, and then summarize the content of the EIS. And just so you all know, the EIS is also posted online at the Battery Park City website, and that'll, the, um, that'll appear in the final slide, the link. So what are the project objectives? F first and foremost, it's to provide a reliable coastal flood barrier system that will uh, reduce flood risk for the residents in the protected area uh, to uh, protect the property and the assets within Battery Park City and the inland neighborhood. And we have a graphic later on which will show you the extent of the protection area. Um, in doing so, it's also a project objective to enhance the open spaces and the waterfront and important cultural resources of Battery Park City. Um, to preserve to the extent possible the character and the accessibility and to enhance accessibility and universal access and where possible enhance the open space and design aesthetics of the neighborhood um, and, and to uh, avoid or minimize impacts to the existing in-ground infrastructure which is extensive. Next slide please. Um, this is a summary of what the project benefits are. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, this is a fl coastal flood risk reduction project. It is designed through the 2050s to address storms and sea level rise projected to the 2050s 
that sea level rise is a projection of two and a half feet of the current surface water elevation along the Hudson River, and also to prevent ponding and drainage impacts along the inland streets from a simultaneous rainstorm event um, uh, up to a depth of one foot. Uh, in doing so, it is also a project objective, as I said earlier, to enhance the public open spaces, the vital and important open spaces of the waterfront along Battery Park City. Uh, there's an objective to increase or enhance the landscaping, and there's nearly a 30% increase in total planting coverage with the project. And uh, that includes nearly two times or a double increase of the open space and landscaping in the ferry terminal area. Also, simultaneous with that is diversify the planting palette to enhance or expand the, the, the tree planting and vegetation and, and herbaceous, herbaceous species within the park. And to improve the in-water habitats, there's going to be a lot of work in the water because the substructure and the structure is along the waterfront and along the Hudson River and will be disturbed. So when it is replaced, the objective is to provide about 1,200 linear feet or about a fifth of a mile of, of uh, environmental benefits and enhancements within the ecological or the aquatic zones. And ultimately, it's a, the objective of the project is to provide uh, also to provide homeowner uh, cost savings through flood reduction, the elimination of uh, Battery Park City from the uh, current fl FEMA flood zone that will reduce the rates and eliminate the need for flood protection for federally backed mortgages. Next slide, please. This slide shows you the area that's protected and gives you some of the specifics. Um, I'll have to lean forward a little bit so you can all hear me. Give you some of the, provide some of the specifics on the numbers of buildings. Uh, there's over 100 buildings, 63. The majority of re are residential, uh, 22 commercial, and 20 public buildings. Uh, there's approximately 25,000 residents that are in the protected area, and a large number of jobs. There's a large commercial core uh, within Battery Park City and the upland areas, uh, 61,000 jobs. The equivalent of 16, almost 16 and a half billion dollars in property value. Uh, major transit centers, including the World Trade Center, uh, World Trade Center hub, uh, major and important community facilities such as the Borough of Manhattan Community College, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, the World Trade Center Memorial, and other vital and critical uh, or important cultural institutions in Lower Manhattan. Next slide, please. As I said earlier, this is a pretty sizable major construction project that will be multi-year. So the, uh, the objective here is to complete the project as quickly as possible and to minimize the disruption to the extent possible, recognizing that this is sort of weaving a, you know, a flood protection project through an existing community. How do you do that? You try to avoid delay. You also want to avoid delay in implementing the flood protection should a storm be imminent, to shorten the overall duration of construction impacts to the community, and to uh, stay, not stay within budget, but to contain project costs and minimize escalation costs. Um, how, how, what will be the sequence of construction? Uh, this construction will begin after Wagner Park has reopened. It's projected to start construction in the summer of next year. Um, it is also a project objective and a construction objective to provide meaning, meaningful open spaces throughout the course of construction. There are sizable, extensive, and critical open spaces along the waterfront, and the objective is to uh, provide compensatory uh, open space. Um, sequence the construction to advance the protection of highest risk areas and the continuous stretches of space that can be reopened the soonest, and to communicate uh, consistently and continually with the community throughout the construction process, recognizing it's a large construction project. Next slide, please. This slide breaks the project into its different phases. Um, for the purposes of the EIS, um, we've identified seven reaches. They're shown here. Um, and uh, you can see that the, the range of construction by reach is uh, the South neighborhood with about 27 months of construction would be the, the fastest and would be the first back online. Uh, and that's balanced with the North neighborhoods along the edge of Rockefeller Park and 
and I should say that Rockefeller Park won't be impacted, but the work is aligned along River Terrace and in the areas of Route 9A and Tribeca, and it works towards the center uh, where uh, in the Brookfield Place or the commercial core has the longest duration of construction, has the most complexity. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this slide uh, is kind of a bulleted or summary of, the, of what the EIS impact analyses uh, disclosed um, in a snapshot way. Um, we use the Seeker technical manual as our guide in these analyses. It's a very regular, rigorous and um, manual in terms of the way it outlines procedures and methodologies and criteria for impacts within the city of New York. The first column here uh, identifies the, uh, the seeker technical areas that didn't have any impacts and didn't require any specific or detailed analyses because once this project is installed, it won't have a population, it won't generate uh, an employment, it'll be a static structure. So um, areas of uh, analysis such as socioeconomic, population-based areas such as socioeconomics or community facilities, solid waste, it won't generate any solid waste or energy needs. Uh, and it's pretty low rise structures, so it won't have a shadow uh, impact or shadow effect on the, on the park. Um, Post-construction technical areas where we, we did a deeper dive to look at, at the uh, potential impacts are identified in column two. I have some slides uh, that follow that go into a little more discussion of what we looked at and what the EIS contains. And the third column uh, is about construction. Probably you know half of the document, uh, the environmental impact statement is dedicated to an analysis of construction impacts and we tried to consolidate the uh, impact assessments into in, uh, no significant impact and temporary significant impacts. And you can see in this column where it's sort of identified that during construction, there would be these temporary significant adverse impacts uh, that you'll find in the environmental impact statement. Next slide, please. Um, so as I said, that second column had some of these more detailed analyses. I'll just walk you through what we looked at. Um, we did a land use analysis and policy analysis. The system won't change land use. It will be protecting land uses, uh, existing land uses. And the uh, did a policy analysis with respect to the city's coastal zone management program. And it, it meets the goals and objectives uh, of the city's WRP or waterfront revitalization program. There would be no, with respect to open space, there'd be no quantitative change in open space. It doesn't reduce the size of any open spaces or recreational facilities. facilities. Um, and um, where possible, or where has been identified during the outreach process, some of the recreation facilities would be um, enhanced. Uh, uh, hazardous materials, um, all projects are required to do a, a soil investigation, which was done by our project team tested all the soils, and as a result of that, there is a soil remediation and management plan that would be implemented for the handling of soils and, uh, that may be uh, uh, disposed of off-site. There's a full analysis of water and sewer infrastructure, which is looking at the, the sewer systems and the water supply systems within the project area that may be modified or need to be upgraded as a result of the project. Um, and one of the key items here is a pump station or pumping station, which would pump rainwater out uh, or accumulated stormwater from the protective area to the Hudson River, which relieves or alleviates the, the potential for any street flooding or property flooding from a simultaneous rain event. Uh, transportation, we looked at the structure and its effects or potential effects um, on sidewalks, particularly in the Tribeca area where the system is aligned along public streets along Route 9A and North Moore Street. Uh, it was the conclusion that the, the system, although it would occupy some portions of the, of the sidewalk, wouldn't significantly impact transportation uh, operations or pedestrian functions. We did a full analysis of greenhouse gas and climate change, and also a neighborhood character assessment, assessment the summary of which was um, when in place, this project will provide a benefit for neighborhood character as a, as a flood protection system for the community. Next slide, please. 
Uh, I'll just do a quick dive into the historic and cultural resource in, uh, assessments. We did a phase one archaeology study along the entire project corridor. As a result of that study, there are some specific areas that will need to be addressed during construction. There, might, there will be pre-construction, what they call phase 1B investigations, and or monitoring during construction to ensure that there's no impacts on archaeological resources. We also did a, an assessment of historic resources and an inventory of historic resources along the project corridor, one of which is the historic bulkhead, which is um, you know, visible within Hudson River Park, but is actually buried uh, along the edge of uh, Stuyvesant High School. Um, and uh, it will, there will be a need to sort of shave a piece of that uh, and cut a small portion of it to install the flood protection system, but we did an outreach with the State Historic Preservation Officer Office, and it was concluded that the, the, the impact on the system would be minimal enough such that it was not a significant impact of the project. There's also approximately 30 uh, visual diagrams within the EIS that show view corridors and changes uh, integrating, the, integrating the flood system into existing views. And you'll see uh, within, the, within, the, uh, within the EIS um, that, that these corridors are maintained and the system is integrated into the existing visual setting. Next slide, please. Uh, natural resources. We looked at both on land and in water potential impacts. The on land, the primary focus is the trees and the trees along the corridor, both street trees and the trees within the park, um, the waterfront parks of Battery Park City. Uh, and there's approximately, uh, we inventoried all the trees, uh, approximately 420 of which would need to be removed due to the construction and installation of the flood wall system. Uh, 21 of these trees are parks trees. They would be along uh, Route 9A and or North Moore Street. Uh, 17 have been identified as potential candidates for transplant. And there is a, a, a design, a landscape plan um, f that is described in the EIS that identifies 390 trees to be replanted as part of the project um, and the, the authority is committed to preserving the healthy trees and also to uh, looking for additional opportunities to expand that tree planting. And that will be described in the FEIS. Uh, the FEIS, I'll skip ahead a little bit, is scheduled for release uh, towards the end of the year. Um, other areas of impact were related to the aquatic zones and the river and the water quality. We examine the effect of piles and in-water infrastructure. There are several piles, there's hundreds of piles that will need to be installed to support the flood barrier system. So we looked at the effects of the piles on the water and the fisheries and the aquatic habitat and the water quality. Uh, each, of, each of those installations uh, requires a Army Corps of Engineers and DEC or US Army, USAC and DEC uh, uh, permit and they have uh, they have been analyzed and submitted as part of a joint permit application and uh, the uh, impacts of the additional structure in the water have been identified and quantified and uh, there's a proposal to uh, to purchase uh, wetland mitigation credits at Sawmill Creek which is a, a wetland restoration site operated by the city of New York through the New York City Economic Development Corporation that's out in Staten Island. So the mitigation would be by acquiring those wetland banking or mitigation credits. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, about half of the document is, is related to the impacts of construction. Um, we've listed here the primary uh, areas of focus, they included temporary open space and the temporary loss and significant impacts due to the loss of accessibility of open space. It will all be restored post-construction, but there will be a period of construction where there will be closures. Transportation, including the uh, uh, bringing in of materials, the employees, and the potential closures or the closures of streets and sidewalks during the course of construction. We did a very uh, rigorous analysis of air quality. Uh, I have another slide about that that follows. I'll go into more detail. 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions, noise, which um, has been a, a, a major area of, of interest for us or concern. So we wanted to make sure we did a full and thorough analysis on the noise impacts and neighborhood character, which is a summation of sort of open space traffic and noise impacts. And um, it's a conclusion of the EIS that there would be, because of these cumulative effects, a, a temporary significant impact on the neighborhood character during the course of the construction period. Next slide, please. So I mentioned air quality. Uh, we looked at approximately 5,200 locations or monitoring receptor locations where we analyzed the, the dispersion of pollutants and emissions from tugboats and trucks and uh, vehicles that would be necessary to construct the project. We did a lot of uh, uh, thorough analysis and with the construction team in terms of understanding the operational characteristics of the equipment and um, uh, based on that work um, and the uh, review with the Department of Environmental Protection, it was concluded that we wouldn't exceed any of the standards for uh, particulate matter uh, down to the lowest micron of 2.5 and the PM 2.10 analysis, as well as other gaseous emissions such as nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide that come from combustion engines. Um, next slide, please. Open space, um, it's unavoidable that, uh, that there will need to be work in open space as a result of the project and there would be temporary significant impacts due to the loss of this space. It's an extensive construction phase and coordination between, uh, uh, there was, ex I should say, it, uh, extensive construction phasing and coordination between the, the authority, the design and environmental teams to make every effort to reduce these impacts, but they are unavoidable um, when needing to install the flood protection system. So there will be temporary closures of multiple open spaces, uh, uh, recognizing that the Rockefeller uh, North, Lawn, North Lawn is proposed to remain open through the course of construction. So there will be an op a waterfront open space available um, through the course of construction. But as a result of our work, which looks at the impacts both qualitatively and quantitatively, um, there would be unavoidable temporary significant adverse impacts that would peak in 2028. I showed that phasing diagram earlier and 2028 is the year when the majority of open spaces along the project corridor would be under construction. Um, the authority is looking at various ways to mitigate these impacts and there will be further analysis between the draft EIS <clears throat> and the FEIS, which will be released in December, uh, ways to enhance and expand upon uh, or provide replacement open spaces. Some of them are listed here, pop-up parks, expanded um, you know, reuse of the streets, street closures and open streets to expand upon open space and recreational opportunities uh, during the course of construction. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also want to recognize that there is a large amount of open space in the, in the surrounding area. Uh, these include Wagner Park, as I said, will be reopened uh, before construction starts uh, along our project corridor. Uh, but there are a number of open, space, uh, open spaces within Battery Park City that would remain open, Rector Park, Teardrop Park, and in the surrounding area that would also remain open, including the Battery, the adjacent Hudson River Park to the north, Washington Market Park and Liberty Park. Next slide, please. Transportation, we did a thorough examination. This graphic on the right shows the study area and all the intersections that we analyzed. We analyzed 14 intersections for the purposes of understanding the impacts from construction workers and truck activity during the course of construction. Um, uh, so in total, there were 14 intersections that were analyzed. Uh, we identified impacts at uh, two in the morning and, and four in the afternoon. There's two peaks essentially with uh, construction worker traffic. Uh, we also looked at the impacts of the implementation of a maintenance and protection of traffic plan, otherwise referred to in the EIS as an MPT plan, which is the, which is the, uh, the barricades that you see in the street that reduce either uh, traffic lanes or pedestrian. So there's those, those are 
get those constraints are factored into the the flow of traffic and the result of that work um, was that one of the two intersections in the a.m. and one of two in the midday, all, all analyzed periods would be significantly impacted. Um, and pedestrians also in terms of the MPT because there will be sidewalk narrowings, diversions, and some uh, temporary closures. We analyzed 14 sidewalk elements, or I should say 14 pedestrian elements. Pedestrians include sidewalks and crosswalks. So it was a pretty thorough analysis of all the sidewalk uh, of all the pedestrian um, uh, routes within the area, uh, and uh, several of them, up to five, in, in the a.m. and p.m. would be impacted, and, and approximately two in the weekday and the Saturday would be impacted. Next slide, please. So given the, the objective of the secret process is not just to disclose, disclose impacts, but also identify mitigation, so we went through a full mitigation analysis to, to uh, document that these impacts could be mitigated. Uh, the traffic impacts at the majority or three of the five intersections could be implemented through signal timing changes. Um, the pedestrian uh, impacts were a little more challenging, but um, at, at, at some through the removal, uh, temporary removal, I should say, of decorative elements that kind of constrain the flow of pedestrians that uh, the impact at one of those locations could be mitigated. But as a result of the work that we did, um, uh, there are unmitigated significant impacts resulting along Route 9A primarily because that's the primary way in and out of the, of the work zones. And uh, several of the pedestrian uh, locations could not be mitigated. Uh, and also we recognized in the EIS that the waterfront and the, the will be closed in, in segments, and that will be rerouting of uh, bicyclists that is unavoidable, and that that's, that's a significant impact um, due to the loss of the, the waterfront for the biking and jogging and walking. Next slide, please. Um, noise, we did a, a really extensive analysis on the noise impact, did a lot of modeling and iterative work with the design team to understand the construction equipment, how it would be operated, the times of day. Um, and the result of all that work um, was we found these locations here that would be impacted. Um, I suppose, you know, in the context of this table, it's, there, it's not particularly helpful, except you see there's different residences and addresses. We do have in the EIS um, a graphic that shows this geographically. Uh, where those locations are, um, but I wanted you to know that you know, we have recognized that there would be potential significant adverse impacts due to the noise emissions during the course of construction. Um, construction, I would say that our analysis was what we call reasonable worst case, and um, you know, so it's looking at the, um, the peak periods, so these impacts aren't going to be throughout the duration of a day or throughout the duration of, a, of the entirety of construction, but we recognize that there would be a peak period and that's what the impact, in, uh, impacts are based upon. Um, and we also recognize that the contractors and the construction teams will be required to comply with the city's noise code and will need to prepare and implement a noise mitigation plan that is reviewed by the Department of Environmental Protection and, and Departments of Buildings before initiating their construction. The next slide shows, uh, based on our impact assessment, we developed with the design team an extensive list of noise mitigation measures that need to be implemented. These are also uh, described in greater detail in the EIS in chapter four, in the mitigation chapter. I'll just summarize quickly here for you what they include. You know, it's limiting the operations uh, as much as possible, no weekend or after hour work with the exception of Route 9A and special deliveries and weather catch up in each, any work outside of the standard work hours requires a permit from the city of New York. Uh, uh, replacing and upgrading equipment over time, uh, it is a five year project. There, we're expecting that there will be advances in, in muffling noise and different types of equipment with lower noise emissions. That's more state of the art. 
uh, and as I, you know, the proper maintenance of equipment and mufflers that are intended to reduce that noise emission. And um, Battery Park City is going to continue to examine what other options there may be, and that will also be described in the final environmental impact statement. Uh, next slide. So this is a final slide just to give you a sense of the schedule. The comment period is uh, open for written comments until October 7th, 2024. It's our intention to uh, complete the FEIS in December of 2024. The final uh, step in the environmental review process is a seeker or state environmental quality review act finding statement, which is also anticipated for uh, the middle of December of 2024. And if you need the website where the uh, DEIS can be found, it's, it's here. Uh, it's on the Battery Park City website and there's the link. Um, next slide. So thank you and thank you for taking the time out to join us here tonight and for your input on the environmental, during the environmental review process. I'm gonna turn it back to Nora uh, to go and see the, the next steps of the hearing. Thank you, Bob. All right, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to go back over a couple of things, and then we will start hearing from folks. We have a nice, robust list of, of people, both in, um, uh, in person as well as online, and we want to make sure we get to everybody tonight. Um, so there are multiple ways to comment if you haven't registered and you prefer to um, not do so orally. Um, you can mail or email a written comment to the Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Team at 200 Liberty Street, 24th floor, New York, New York, 10281. Or you can email to nwbpcrinfo at bpca.ny.gov. Um, and as a reminder to everyone, um, there won't be a response to comments or questions that are heard tonight. They will be entered into the formal record and will be responded to in the final environmental impact statement. Um, so for those who pre-registered to speak tonight, you will be seeing your names appear on the screen. Um, we'll hear from, um, from people in the order in which they registered. And we're going to rotate in groups, um, starting with a group from online, and then we'll go to a group in person, and then we'll go back and we'll go forth. Uh, if you are attending virtually to those who are, and if you pre-registered, when, when your name is called, we will unmute your microphone. Um, for commenters who are attending in person, when we call your name, we would ask that either you stand and if you wish to come to the mic, that's fine. Or raise your hand and my colleague, Jared, Jared, wave at everybody, um, will bring a microphone to you um, and, and you can provide your comment. Uh, we'd ask each commenter, whether you're online or you're in person, to identify yourselves and if applicable, to tell us the organization on whose behalf you are speaking at the beginning of your comment. I'll alert each commenter, or we'll do so through Jared, um, when you have about 30 seconds left in your three minute allocation for, for comment. Um, I'll thank you for your comment at the end of the three minutes and move on to the next commenter. If time allows, at the conclusion of hearing from all of the pre-registered speakers, uh, we may be able to hear additional comments from those who did not pre-register, but that doesn't mean you can't submit your comment no matter what. Um, you can do so via mail and you can do so via email, and I'll be repeating those um, funnel, those channels for you during the night. If you're attending virtually and you'd like to submit a comment, but you didn't pre-register, just click on the link that's posted in your Zoom chat the link will take you to a virtual form, and there you can submit your name to comment. Your name will then come up on the, um, on the registered online list. If you're attending in person and you'd like to submit but didn't pre-register, 
please use your mobile device to scan the QR code on the screen and submit your name to the virtual form. You may also visit the registration table that is just outside this room and sign up. Once registered, your name will then appear in the online list. We'll hear comments in the order in which they are posted. Um, and if you don't have a chance, if, you're, if your comment goes beyond the three minutes, I'm gonna hold to three minutes out of respect for all of the speakers to give everyone an equal opportunity to speak. Um, but if your comment isn't finished by the end of three minutes, I would ask that you submit your full comment after tonight's hearing via email or mail um, to make sure that the fullness of it and everything you had to say gets entered into the um, record. So let's get started. Beginning means smooth sailing the rest of the way through. Can you use something else? technology being what it is, um, I'm just gonna go over how you can send things via mail and send them via email one more time and hopefully we will have this resolved. Um, you can mail or email a written comment to Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project Team at 200 Liberty Street, 24th floor, New York, 10281, or you can email to nwbpcrinfo at bpca.ny.gov. Can you give me the okay to start? Yep. Okay, great. Technology is your friend until it's not your friend, right? So we're going to start um, with Lonnie, Lonnie Passage. She is online. Um, and if someone could uh, unmute Lonnie, we'd be happy to hear from her. We are obviously having a computer challenge. I'll be back in one second. I'm gonna to switch to in-person um, while they're trying to figure out whatever technology is happening. So let's start with Suzanne Ring. Suzanne? All right, maybe Suzanne will join us a little later. Seema Mwadwa, Seema? Okay, Helena Fazera. Helena, would you like to, it brought to you or would you like to come down? Up to you. Just please say your name, and if you are um, representing an organization, please say that as well. Okay. 
Jared, I can't hear her. Could you please make sure that um, microphone is working? Thank you. I, I'm, I was extremely concerned about what happened at uh, Wagner Park. And um, my main question would be, what's going to happen to those 420 trees? that are going to be, I guess, uprooted. And um, do you plan on replanting them? I mean, what is the, they're just being discarded. What is the idea? And what does actually increasing or enhancing landscaping afterwards mean? It was at both my concerns. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Stephen Gersowitz. Stephen? Yoshimasa Sayara. Okay, hopefully they will send us their comments in writing. Can I switch to the online? Okay, we're going to go back online to Lonnie Passage. Would you re unmute Lonnie, please? Paul Rikoff. Are you able to unmute Paul Rikoff if he's attending? Okay, Paul's not here. Tom Radionov. So the tech team is Tom online. All right, Tom is not here. Is Vittorio Fariello here? Vittoria Fariello? Okay, I'll try one more in that group. Kate Smith. Is Kate Smith attending? Okay, we'll switch back to in person. See if some of our friends online decide they would like to speak. Um, Ting Wu. No comment? Okay. Um, Alice Blank. Thank you. My name is Alice Blank. If many of you know me. I'm vice chair of Manhattan Community Board One, and I'm chair of the uh, board's Environmental Protection Committee. Alice, may I ask you, are you speaking for? Yes, I am. Okay. So you have five yeah. minutes. Okay. Well, I only was told I need three, and I hopefully have gone under, so thank you. Um, Manhattan Community Board One has been reviewing the Battery Park City Resiliency Plans for around nine years, issuing numerous resolutions on all aspects of the South and North projects, including the project's need, planning, design, and community impacts. This past week, both Community Board One's Battery Park City and Environmental Protection Committees have reviewed the draft Environmental Impact Statement, DEIS, for the Northwest section of the park and will issue our final comments on the document by the deadline on October 7th. 
CB1 is aligned with the principal objectives of the proposed project as stated in the DEIS, which include the Battery Park City Authority's commitment to, one, provide a system that relies on passive flood control rather than mechanical, two, to minimize the urban heat island effect, and three, that the project's construction and operation be achieved in an environmentally responsible manner. CB1 would like to ensure that the final environmental impact statement elaborates and clarifies with much detail, more detail, how these principal objectives will be achieved. For example, with regard to reviewing the project's effects on climate change, the DEIS addresses the impacts of construction, estimating the project's addition of over 44,000 metric tons, rather, of CO2 into the environment, but there seems to be no estimate of the effects demolition has on the carbon footprint. The FEIS should take into account both the construction and demolition associated with the project and should detail with what specific measures are being taken and materials used to reduce the project's impactful greenhouse gas emissions. The FEIS should also clarify how the removal of the 420 trees and the addition of the large quantity of concrete walls, benches, and paving will impact the urban heat island effect and how long it will take to mitigate these effects. The community has long asked that a federal variance <clears throat> for the removal of the trees be reconsidered and looks forward to a confirmation that this can, in fact, be done. The community also requests that the Battery Park City Authority scheduled the promised meeting with all stakeholders to review how the project will be integrated into the city, state, city, state and federal plans that are proposed along Route 9A. Lastly, the community urges that the final EIS include information that ensures that the Battery Park City Authority project will have no harmful effects on the resiliency of neighboring areas in our community, particularly those that were, unlike most of Battery Park City, flooded and acutely affected during Superstorm Sandy on the west side north of the proposed tie-ins in North Moore Street and Tribeca at Canal Street. Community Board 1 looks forward to providing full written comments at all aspects of the DEIS and thanks the Battery Park City Authority very much for their engagement with the community on this critically important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blaine. Steve Doherty. Hello. I just have, I, mine's going to be a very informal after this very, like, kind of boring production we've had so far today. But Can um, you just repeat your name, please? I'm, I'm sorry, Steve Doherty. If you have any. Steve Doherty, and I'm just a resident representing my own self. Thank you. And I've been a long time resident down here. And I was going to say that this is the first time I've been in Stuyvesant High School since two nights after 9 11. I had run from my apartment to get my daughter out of in her school and then ran back to try to get my dog and could not. So I was like, for three days, so two, two days and two nights, I was struggling to get back here. I was a nervous wreck. I was shaking and it was completely insane. And I was outside of this high school at four in the morning and finally came in here to look for help, somebody to get down and get my dog. And there was a rabbi here. And he was here from New Jersey to help survivors, and there weren't any. And so he went and got my dog for me. And it was like, you know, my hands are still shaking from that experience that week. And that's what the impact that wasn't analyzed in your report here was the effect on the people who lived here. And that the scars are gone, you know, not visible, but the trauma is still very present. And we were suddenly faced with this new, are we going to have another trauma where people are going to have to really decide whether they want to continue to live here anymore. And a lot of people moved, some of us stayed, and we revived this neighborhood. And there was no consideration of that. I've, an official said that um, any protest about what was planned for Wagner Park, which was the, its demolition, and we see what is replaced now, this giant iron wall that um, there was no indication of in the very pretty renderings that we saw of it. 
but um, I'm getting off topic now because it's, uh, it upsets me. And um, it just seems that there was nothing like the stakeholders. You know, I'm sure that if Goldman Sachs had some trees that had to be removed, they'd be asked about it. We were told these trees, well, they say they're being removed, but I saw them, they were cut down. Like living trees are just chopped off and there's no, re I'm sorry, madam, but there's no removing them. They're dead, they're gone. And I would like to think that, I'm sorry, 30 seconds, okay, sorry. Um, but I wish, th I'd also like to know who's profiting from this. Were there bids let out to, for the development of this park? For this reboot, and um, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Doherty. Okay, we're going to go back online. Let's start with Kate Smith. Kate? Yes, I'm here. Um, just a moment. We have a very noisy area. Can you hear me? Can you, can, can you confirm you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, fantastic. All right. Um, yes, I, I don't know if you addressed this already, but I, I live at 70 Battery Place. And 70 Battery and 50 Battery and um, a, a couple, several other buildings, we ring the area uh, where with that is often referred to as the blue lights because uh, it's just so pretty. And last time I, at your last meeting, I had asked about the plan for the area immediately behind 50 battery and 70 battery leading all the way up to the, um, and then making that corner and leading up to, uh, to uh, the, uh, Goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> Basically, behind these two buildings, I'm I'm very concerned that uh, it's going to be ripped out. It is absolutely beautiful. It's obviously a lot of attention was paid to its design, and it attracts tourists here all the time. I I, I again, I'm here right now, and the place is teeming with activity. If <laughs> Can you tell me, is there a plan to redesign this area as well? Because right now it's already multi-level. I, I think it probably already meets the, the criteria that you're looking to achieve elsewhere. But it, I am asking you the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go to Anthony Coppola, also online. Mark Greenwald. Is Mark available online? Jeff Galloway. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Galloway. I'm a resident of the Gateway Apartments that are immediately adjacent to Reaches 5 and 6. Um, although I serve on Community Board 1 as well as the Gateway Tenants Association, I'm speaking only on behalf of myself and not on behalf of these organizations. Um, 
The project description, as well as some of the supporting materials, such as the coastal modeling report in, in the appendices, uh, do a very good job of setting out uh, the need for the project and the technical bases for uh, some of the uh, physical aspects of the project, including the flood ball. Um, and, and I'd like to thank the authority for taking a leadership role in protecting lower Manhattan from the increased risk of coastal storms and uh, sea level rise. I wanted to address uh, two comments or two subjects on the draft EIS tonight. One is the construction impacts and the other is an element of operations. Regarding the construction impacts, the draft EIS does a good job of identifying impacts, but it has uh, considerably less detail on how those impacts are going to be mitigated. And those and, and detailed description of mitigation really needs to be in the final uh, EIS. Um, the construction impacts have uh, at least two broad categories, and, and one is just the duration of the project, and the other is the intensity of the impacts. Um, and in particular, noise and vibration is going to be very significant for all of the residential buildings uh, that are adjacent uh, to the project. And so really every conceivable measure needs to be taken to mitigate uh, noise and vibration impacts. And those mitigation measures need to be described in detail uh, in the final EIS. Um, also during construction, uh, the residents and visitors need a, a point of contact with the project with a phone number and some means of getting into contact online in a real-time basis so that residents can reach out if they have any issues during construction um, or if they believe that some of the promised mitigation measures are not being uh, implemented. We also need constant communication from the project team during construction giving notice in advance of disruptive work so that people can take steps to deal with it. Um, yes, people may know there's going to be uh, pile driving or whatever it is in theory, but they may not know that it's going to be next week. Uh, so continual updates are very important. In terms of the duration, I, I want to state the obvious. Five years is a long time, and certain aspects uh, will take five years. And when you think of it in terms of the children who live in Battery Park City, or for that matter, the seniors, the kids, five years is a significant chunk of the rest of their childhood. And for seniors like me, it's a significant chunk of the rest of your life. Uh, and so any and everything that can be done to, to try to shrink that duration time uh, without intensifying the impact along the way really should be done. Um, and um, in terms of the public uh, park space that's being consumed during construction, I, I commend the authority in trying to use imaginative measures to look for other alternative spaces for public use. And that needs to be- Mr. Uh, Galloway, I wanna thank you for your comment, um, but we're going to close and you've, you've gotten to your three minutes. We really appreciate your comment. If you would like to submit the remainder of your comment, um, please do so um, either by mail or via email. Thank you. Is Carolyn Cartwright available? There's another online. I should say we have no other in-person registrants to speak. I want to make sure that's correct. We have none in the system. Buff Cableman. I'm going to keep going with the online that we have registered. Hello? Oh, that is that Carolyn? Hello, Carolyn. Uh, no, this is Buff Cavalman. Oh, great. Okay, Buff, you're on. Um, I really appreciated Jeff Galloway's questions, and I'd like to add one that I think relates to them. I'd like to understand what is the impact on the transportation for this neighborhood during the period, especially the. M9 and M20 buses and the Downtown Alliance Connection bus, um, as well as any car services and 
means that we have to get in and out of the area. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the end of your comment as well? Yes, that's Alrighty. it for now. Thank you. Um, so let me go on to Beth Coleman. Beth? Okay, I'm going to keep going. Just want you to know that the people that we're calling on are people who registered to speak. And so we make available this time. Um, they may have chosen to switch to submitting their comment in writing or via email um, or in some other way. Um, but we just go through the list and make sure everybody has the, the time that they asked for. Um, Tom Fox, also online affiliated with the Hudson River Park Advisory Committee, the City Club of New York. Tom Fox, are you available online? I am here, can you hear me? Welcome. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Tom, are uh, you I, speaking for the organization? I am, yes, because the resolution will be coming from the Hudson River Park Advisory Council and one from the City Club of New York regarding this very issue. All right, understood. You have um, then five minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't think I need as much, but I appreciate that. Um, the, uh, we find the DEIS um, basically insufficient in that it neglects to look at water quality. Um, and water quality, I mean water quality in the Hudson River Park Estuarine Sanctuary. Um, you did assess the uh, sewer and water impacts, but you looked at the piles, the construction of the piles and the impact it would have on fisheries and such. And there was no negligent, no significant impact. However, the pumping station that you're putting in is designed to transport the surface water that falls behind the um, uh, resiliency uh, that you're putting in and as the gentleman said, in the case of a dual effect, and you have rainwater and tidal surges, uh, it's going to flush that into the Hudson River Park Estuarine Sanctuary, which we worked for 20 years to get to be a protected estuarine sanctuary through New York State. And I didn't see any um, assessments of the water quality long term. Uh, the, the impact on fisheries or water quality in that environment, or the impact on the sailing um, vessels that are now moored there, how many will have to be relocated, or the impact this water quality surge, if you will, of surface water contaminated with um, oil and the detritus off the street would have, it's coming out in, I think it's NCM 078, the sewer outfall. Uh, right into the estuary. Uh, and this part of the sanctuary is in a corner. There's not a lot of circulation. So I think it's the worst place to be vacating all of this water into the Hudson River. And I'm wondering if the final EIS might look at this impact, uh, because I think it was uh, omitted, um, to, not on purpose, I'm sure. Um, and secondarily, uh, if the plan might include, you're extending the um, bulkhead, the wall over Battery Park City uh, at Stuyvesant on the north, north end. Uh, would it be possible, rather than just dumping this sewage into uh, the Hudson River Park estuarine sanctuary, to run a pipe to the Hudson River? Uh, well, first, to send it to a sewage treatment plant to be properly treated before it's disposed of in our waterways. That would be a, a primary um, mitigation. But uh, secondarily, if you're going to vacate the water into the Hudson River, don't do it in this um, uncirculating corner of an estuarine sanctuary. Run the pipe out to the bulkhead of Battery Park City and vacate it in the main flow of the Hudson River where it can be distributed more quickly and diluted more regularly and not affect the estuarine sanctuary, which is Thank you. designated a sanctuary for a reason. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. 
Um, I'm going to move on to David Caporal, um, affiliated with Tribeca Sailing. David? Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, David, could you tell me, are you representing Tribeca Sailing? I'm a, I'm a uh, business owner in North Cove Marina and I live in Gateway, so yes. Okay, so representing an organization, you have five minutes to speak, so thank you. I won't need it, but thank you. Yep. Um, yep. I'm also uh, official, um, unofficially representing the seven other mar maritime businesses in North Cove Marina. My question is very simple. Um, will we be able to get another season at North Cove uh, for 2025, a full season from April to November or October? Um, and that's my only question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, move on to Michelle Ashkin. Michelle, also online. Hello. Good evening, Michelle. Happy to have Hi. you. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. A uh, few, just, just a few quick uh, things uh, uh, regarding the trees. I've been in, I've been discussing the trees for at all the meetings. Uh, but one of the uh, speakers did bring up the variance issue, and I would like to say that I have personally gone and looked at all the trees in this area. I live on Rector Place, so all the trees from, um, I guess, from that, that line, the promenade along Rector and beyond. There are many trees, not all of them, of course, but there are many trees that at the moment are 15 feet, are well beyond, not well beyond, but maybe I have to go measure, but they're beyond the 15 feet. And when I brought this point up on one of the walks, it became... Uh, kind of clear to me that while that might be the case, it it is difficult to get machinery in, and that the it, you know if you have a tree here and there. And so my understanding, my when I walked away from that was that you know what they're they're doing the equivalent of a clear cut to make easy to make it easier to get machinery. And while I understand that you're taking out unnecessarily, I think uh, a number of trees that are mature, beautiful, healthy trees, which we love and covet in this area. So I, I think that's something we re need to, to revisit if they are not within the 15 foot variance, you know, uh, uh, area, then why, why can't we keep them? Why can't we figure out a way to at least keep some of them um, in place without destroying all of them? I also wanted to make a comment about the wildlife because of course, nobody speaks about the wildlife. And I'm very concerned about what's gonna happen to the animals that live here when we take away every tree that they need, all the food sources that they need, all the areas that they need to either bury or find food, what are we gonna do? We have many, many, many squirrels and of course, tons of birds. Birds hopefully can fly off and find other places to nest. Squirrels have no place to go. I don't know what else lives here, but certainly we have squirrels and while people may not care about squirrels and they say they're just squirrels, they're living beings, they are our wildlife. They gave many of us solace after 9-11 when they finally returned. And we have no, we have sort of a moral obligation, I think, not to destroy everything. There are ways we can mitigate some of this for them. I would like to, uh, I will write that into my comments. And the last thing I want to say very quickly is that um, what I don't understand is if, if, if how, how are we doing, and I really don't understand, how are we doing how are we doing any work, like the work that's being done right now at Rector Place to, to and prep for the pump, when we don't even have a final environmental impact statement, right? So we, we don't even know what, the, I mean, I don't understand all the legalities, but I would think that we shouldn't have gone forward with the work now until we have a final uh, environmental impact statement for the whole project. Um, and uh, that's kind of where I'll leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ashkin. Um, that concludes the registered speakers, but it doesn't conclude your opportunity to speak. So if you are attending in person and you would like to submit a comment and did not pre-register, you have two choices. We have a table outside this hearing room 
where you can go register and we will be happy to hear what you have to say. Um, or you can scan the QR code that's on the screen and submit your name in the virtual room. If you are attending online um, and you also did not pre-register, you can just click on the link that's posted in the Zoom chat and that link will take you to a virtual form where you can submit your name to comment. Your name will then appear on the online list. Um, we'll keep checking to see if any of the folks who had registered to speak um, come on online and then we will of course go to hear them speak. So other than that, I am going to come back every so often and tell you how to submit your comment in writing, whether you want to do it via mail or you want to do it via email. And we will start, if I can find my list. Um, if you wish to send your written comment um, by mail, you can do so to Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project Team at 200 Liberty Street, 24th floor, New York, New York, 10281, or you can email it if you prefer to nwbpcrinfo at bpca.ny.gov. So again, there's a registration table outside of this hearing room, and if you would like to speak, please go register, and we will be happy to listen to what you have to say. So to anyone who's online, um, there's plenty of time to, to come in and speak, even if you were registered before but weren't available then. If you've become available, we'd be happy to hear from you. Um, we will be keeping the lines open until 8 o'clock when this, is, this hearing is scheduled to close. Um, feel free to, to place a, um, a registration in the link if you click the link in the chat. Um, we can get you online.
So we have an online registrant. I'd like to hear from Kathleen Keenan. Kathleen? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, I have a, um, a comment about noise because this is a very big construction project and I'm thinking, well, what kind of noise are we gonna hear? Jackhammers, compressors, pile drivers, truck noise, that wonderful sound when they're backing up, beep, beep, beep. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of dust. There are gonna be vibrations. Uh, and if, if this goes on for years, then the people who live anywhere near River Terrace, uh, it sounds like it's, it's going to make living there practically uh, unlivable with such high noise levels every day. I don't know if that's going to happen, but that's what it sounds like. So I'm hoping that there's some, there's going to be some comments about the noise levels and what kind of construction equipment are going to be out there over this extended period and whether there's any compensation for people living near River Terrace. Um, thank you. That's my comment. Thank you. So just a reminder for those online and anyone in person who wants to comment, um, comments that are made tonight, questions that are raised tonight, uh, will be addressed in the final environmental impact statement. They are all being entered into the um, the the document documentation. Um, the final environmental impact statement is expected to be released in early 2025, but they will not be responded to tonight. So again, if anyone else online um, would like has not pre-registered and would like to make a comment, as our last commenter did, um, just click on the link that's posted in the Zoom chat. It will take you to a virtual form, and you'll be able to submit your name in order to comment, and your name and will then show up in the in the queue. So online, we have a commenter, um, Carrie Parker Davidson. Carrie, if we've unmuted you, could you announce yourself? Thank you. I noticed in the transportation exhibit 
that the analysis on the impact of narrowing sidewalks and the volume of use of cyclists and pedestrians in their in uh, in that space, um, the analysis talks about the fact that there's still a smaller but clear path provided, but it does not share what the density of usage is within those clear paths. So if you are reducing the operative area for mobility, it's not enough to just say what the revised clear path is. It needs to have a density analysis. So I would like to see the impact, uh, the environmental impact study address the density of traffic within those narrowed paths. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parker-Davidson. Another online commenter, we have Bill Weidner. Bill, if you're unmuted, could you announce yourself, please? Bill Weidner. Bill, you've been, you are unmuted on the system, but we're not able to hear you. You know, sometimes if you turn your sound off and then on again, that helps. And if not, then jumping off and logging back in can help. And we certainly will be here to hear from you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I I had my I have like a microphone hooked up. I don't know why. I That's okay. That microphone, so I changed it to a different microphone. All right. So my name is Bill Widener. I live at Gateway for the last four years, and I'm talking about this from a residential occupancy point of view. Residential occupancy in the area is either rental, condominium, or co-op. Condominium and co-op being ownership, and rental, of course, being tenancy. Now, without even looking at the business side of it, which I think should be included on some level as well, this project should include a significant tax abatement for co-ops and condos. And it also should include some kind of subsidy for what everyone is going to be dealing with down here that lives in a rental property. And it should not be borne uh, for the rental properties by the owner of the rental property. It should be borne by the city or state or the federal government or, or whoever it is that would contribute to such, such a, uh, an abatement so that it can be passed along to the tenants. And we can continue to live here and deal with the significant noise and the significant time that this is going to take. And what's happening is it's pretty much taking away every aspect of why we live here. And so we should be compensated for that. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. So we've added a few previously not registered online commenters, and if others who are online are thinking they'd like to share a comment or a question, 
Um, all you need to do is to click on the link that's posted in the Zoom chat. The link will take you to a virtual form where you can submit your information to comment. Your name will then show up in the queue that is on the um, screen and we will get your comment entered. For anyone who has provided comments or asked questions during tonight's public hearing, they will be addressed in the FEIS, the Final Environmental Impact Statement, and will be entered into the documentation. We had many registrants to speak who perhaps have chosen not to speak tonight, but they may still want to submit their comment, and you can do so in writing. Um, if you prefer, you can mail your comment to the Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project Team at 200 Liberty Street, 24th floor, New York, New York, 10281, or if you prefer to use email, you can email it at nwbpcrinfo at bpca.ny.gov.
So we still have about 35 people online. Um, and if any of you would like to um, comment, but you didn't pre-register, please just click on the link that's posted in the Zoom chat and it will take you to a virtual form where you can submit your name to comment. Your name will then appear in the online list. And we'll work with you to help you with your microphone if you have a challenge with it.
So we have about 10 minutes left in this hearing to hear uh, verbal comments. Um, but want to remind you that the uh, comment period will close October 7. Uh, the public review and comment period on the DEIS started August 28, 2004, and will close October 7, 2004. Um, if you don't wish to comment verbally tonight, um, you can certainly do so by mailing or emailing a written comment to Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project Team at 200 Liberty Street, 24th Floor, New York, New York, 10281, or by email at nwbpcrinfo at bpca.ny.gov. And again, if you change your mind and would like to get your comment in verbally tonight, um, all you need to do if you're attending virtually is to click on the link that's posted in the Zoom chat and submit your name to the online form. It will then appear in the online list and we will get you online right, right away to speak. I want to correct myself. I understand I misspoke on a year. The public review and comment period on this DEIS began August 28, 2024, and will close on October 7, 2024.
So we have about five minutes left until eight o'clock when we'll close this portion, the this public hearing. Um, I want to make sure if anyone wants to speak, we still have time for comments. Um, and if you'd like, if you'd like to speak tonight, just click on the link that's posted in the Zoom chat. It will take you to a virtual form where you can submit your name to comment. Your name will then appear in the queue and we'll get you online. If your preference is to submit your comments in writing, you can do so either by mail or by email. If you do so by mail, please send them to Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project Team, 200 Liberty Street, 24th floor, New York, New York, 10281. Or you can send it via email at nybpcrinfo at bpca.ny.gov. You can also review the DEIS and other project documents on the website at bpca.ny.gov. I understand there's a person by the name of MG online who would like to speak. Would you please enter your full name so that we can get you online? Mark Greenwald, is that Mark Greenwald? Unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Mr. Greenwald. You get the last um, comment tonight. Oh, good. Okay, yeah, I've had trouble trying to figure out how to unmute. But anyway, I'm concerned about the restaurants in the marina area and how they will be impacted. Do they stay open? Um, I want to um, support, support, support what the other members said. Um, I'm a shareholder. We uh, purchased here two years ago on River Terrace, 20 River Terrace, and very concerned about the quality of life for the next five years. I'm a senior. Uh, it is a significant part of my life. Um, and I moved here for the beauty, had uh, no idea of what I was buying into with this project. Um, and uh, I feel also that uh, in terms of abatements and uh, cost of maintaining our property uh, with the quality of life going down for this period of life, I would like that to be addressed. Um, I, I think that's about it for now. I'll continue to attend meetings and see where else we go from here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greenwald. So we're at eight o'clock at the close of tonight's hearing. Um, I want to remind you that if you would like to submit comments, um, you can do so in writing after the hearing uh, via email at nwbpcrinfo at bpca.ny.gov or by mail to Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project Team at 200 Liberty Street, 24th floor, New York, New York, 10281. I want to thank you for attending tonight's hearing. 
Comments will be accepted until October 7, 2024. This hearing is now closed.